today we're going to talk about colimits using the same formalism that we've already come to know and love about limits. Now I don't know if you can hear, but the rain is pounding against the window, so perhaps that will add a little bit of atmosphere to the situation. Now I've left on the board the diagram we had of this limit, where remember the blue cone is our limit cone, which is a universal cone, and the universal condition was given any cone, for example this orange one, there is a unique factorization in pink here. And I've written the formal, the formal um, formula for it up here. So now here's the same diagram over which we previously took a limit, and now we're going to take a co-limit. Of course, this is easy, right? Because we've just got to dualize the entire definition of limit because co-limits are just the dual of limits. So what does that actually mean in terms of these cones? Well, first of all, the cone is going to be the other way up because here, a cone consisted of an object together with morphisms towards the diagram whose limit we were taking. So now we're going to reverse that, which means it's going to be an object together with morphisms away from the, the diagram whose limit we're taking. So again, for every object in the diagram, we have a morphism to our vertex, like this, which I'm still drawing in blue because this is going to be the universal one. Here's another object, and here's another object. And the commuting condition is, again, that every triangle involving two of these blue arrows and one of these white arrows has to commute. So this is sometimes called a cone under the diagram, where this one is a cone over the diagram. There's something slightly arbitrary about this over and under business. Well, actually, no, there isn't, because it makes the arrows go down the page. We like arrows that go down the page better than arrows that go up the page. Um, this is also sometimes called a co-cone, which is one of those times when sticking co on the beginning of your word makes your word a bit stupid. Never mind. It's also just, it's a cone. It just happens to be the other way up from this one. Um, right, waffle, waffle, waffle. So what's the universal condition for this cone going to be? Well, we've got to say for any other cone, so let's draw an other cone, um, and it's going to be an orange again like the previous one. So let's put a vertex down here, and again, for every object in the diagram, we've got to have a morphism to our vertex. Hmm, this orange isn't working quite as well as it was. Oh, here we are. Um, here's a vertex. Uh, uh, here's a vertex. Uh, uh, oh, sorry. And here is another vertex. So that's another cone. And we've got to say that this other one factors uniquely through the first one, which means that there's a unique factorization going from here to here. Now, you'll notice one of the striking facts here is that this time it's going from the universal one to the other one, whereas in the limit it was going from the other one to the universal one. And that's because the blue one has to be, the universal one is supposed to be a factor of the other one, which means that you've got to compose the universal one with the other factor, the pink factor, to get the orange one. And if you tried filling it in backwards, then you wouldn't be doing it that way around. You'd be having your factors making up the blue one. So that's the correct direction, the only possible direction to make pink a factor, uh, a factor for the orange one. So, um, right, that's the picture. Oh, I've left out. Oh, no, I haven't. Um, so let's just run over the cone definition of colimit again. Given this white diagram here, a colimit for it is a cone under it such that, given any other cone under it, there exists a unique factorization. And, of course, the commuting condition for the unique factorization is that every triangle involving a blue an orange and our unique factorization has to commute. And here it was also a blue, an orange, and our unique factorization. It's just that our blue and our orange were the other way up. They were coming down like this. Uh, uh, what am I talking about? Yes, like this. So 
that was the commuting condition for the factorization. Over here. So now let's try and write this out like this, this abstract thing. So first of all, the easy part. There's going to be a natural isomorphism, right? Between something and something else. So again, we've got to think, for every cone, there exists a unique morphism. That means that there's a bijection between cones and morphisms somehow. So first of all, let's write down the morphisms. Now previously, it was morphisms from some object V to the vertex, which is this limit. Now, it's morphisms from this limit to the vertex V. So it's going to be morphisms from the limit. Have I left myself enough space? From the limit. And now we write the arrow towards the underneath going the opposite direction, going to V. And that limit is sometimes also written as, oh no, I didn't, oh yes, this one comes in there. That's another way of writing the co-limit vertex. So this is the morphisms from the limit vertex to the other vertex. And that's got to be naturally isomorphic to, well, it's still going to be something in this functor category. But this time, of course, our vertex, remember this delta, this constant functor, was giving us the vertices of cones. And this was the actual functor. So this functor is the one that gives us the diagram in the category that we're thinking about. Um, and, and this one is this one is the vertex part of the cone. So this is cones under our diagram, and this is morphisms giving this factorization here. And if you compare it directly with the definition above, you can see that literally all we've done is we've taken the opposite category. So if this was in C op, right, then we would just turn we just turn the whole set round to produce this one. And if this was C op, Remember, if you do natural transformations into C op, then all your components get turned around as well. So your natural transformation is going in the opposite direction. So that's why these two get switched over. And so the moral of that story is that limits in C are the same as co-limits in C op. And also co-limits in C op are the same as limits in C. Um, now, the last thing I want to mention about these cones is that you can think of all uh, you can think of all limits as terminal objects somewhere, and you can think of all co-limits as initial objects somewhere, where in a kind of category of cones. So if you look at this, imagine that given this diagram, there's a category of cones over it. The objects are the cones over it, and the morphisms are these factorizations from one cone to another, making everything commute in the right way. In which case, this blue one being universal says precisely that it's terminal in that category of cones because it's saying, given any other cone, there's a unique morphism from here to here. And the initial object version is that in this category of cones under the diagram, we've got the morphisms which are cones under it, and well, the objects are cones under the diagram, and the morphisms are factorizations like this, making all the triangles commute. In that case, saying that this blue one is um, a co-limit universal cone is exactly saying it's an initial object in this category of cones under, because it's saying, given any other cone, there exists a unique morphism going that way. Now, because co-limits in C are just limits in C op, um, in fact, terminal objects are just initial objects in the opposite category. So actually, we can push this one step further and say that all limits and co-limits are just initial objects somewhere. And we can even sort of take the view that all universal properties are just initial objects somewhere.